the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudate Jesus Christus. In secular, yeah, in secular man. Jeremiah Bannister. How you doing, brother? I'm doing I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. A little bit, a little bit uh kind of on the fringe of things at this point, man. I've got long hair. I feel like a hippie at this point. I sported some patchouli, you know, to really get into the act. I even changed my name. People can see at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Uh, we, we had a little technical difficulty, so thanks for your, your patience, everybody. We're trying to work out a new system so we can have musical intros and all sorts of fun stuff on Mean of Catholic. So we haven't figured it out yet, so we'll, we'll get that in the future, God willing. But tonight's topic is racism, riots, mm -hmm. and newspeak. Uh, the world is destroying itself faster and faster, it seems. Uh, first, we had the COVID outbreak and COVID-1984 reaction. And now we've got looters and pillagers throughout the nation outraged at true injustice and racism and all sorts of evil. Uh, and in response, doing evil uh, to respond to it. So we're going to deal with a lot of things, try to try to pin, to pound, pin down a lot of things here, if we can, God willing. Um, and... I, I wanted to kind of start with trying to figure out what is racism and what we can define it as. Um, and we can talk back and go back a little bit into the history. Um, but Jeremiah, what would you, how would you define what is, I mean, racism is a sin, wouldn't you say? Yes. So, yes. so judging, what, judging people based on the color of their skin is well, a sin. <laughs> well, you, well, define yeah. judging. What do you mean by judging? Yeah, uh, an undue judgment, right? Simply uh, a grotesque stereotype. And, I, and I've and i been on record in the past. I've, in fact, I've got a, a video about diversity at my YouTube channel at Paleocrat, and people can see that. Uh, it's about diversity, and it talks about racial stereotypes. So I um, don't entirely believe they're without merit. And yet at the same time, to attribute that uh, across the board in a way that uh, is is uncharitable. Right. And not recognizing the individuality of a person who may, in fact, deviate and it may, maybe even in all likelihood deviate from the stereotype um, that to me would be a kind of racism. Unlike well, it would be racism, unlike the the modern idea of this that tethers it together with systems of power, which I believe is entirely untenable. How do they what do you mean by that ties it together with systems of power? Well, uh, where, where they say, well, you know, for example, you hear a common refrain nowadays that uh, a black person cannot be racist because black people are not in power. Um, and that but that's a relative scale. I mean, if you say, well, OK, so on a federal level, you're going to use that as your standard and say, well, governmentally at a federal level uh, or, or certain cultural dynamics. But what if you're in a school, for example? where you are a minority. My kids had this example. My kids got, one of my children got beat up because they were white. Um, another one was told they weren't allowed to be friends with them because they were white. Another one was told that he was stupid because he's white. White people are dumb. And that kind of stuff happened. But that's not racist because, because on, a, on a big scale, uh, black people don't have power and that white people have the power. And therefore, white people in this scenario White people can be uh, racist. Black people, at worst, could be prejudicial. And okay. so, but yeah, but it, it, it doesn't even factor in the idea that in that s specific scenario, the white children did not have the power. <laughs> so in that particular scenario, in that particular context, could black people be racist? I mean, is that how it works on a global scale? Where do you draw that line? It's a convenient thing. Yeah, and I, I think there is a... Um there is an amount of truth to that because I think historically I'm thinking when I, th I thought about this a little bit um, historically, I think of there's this famous debate that happens in Spain in the 1500s between a guy named um, 
de Sepulveda versus this guy named Bartolome de las Casas. And they're debating whether or not the Indians are subhuman and you can enslave them. And this would be basically, I mean, I would, I would understand the origins of racism, at least in the sort of the modern era of colonialism to present, you know, there's different forms of it. I think more in the ancient world too, but I, I think I, I view it as a, an ideology, which is, an attempt of the elites to justify sin against vulnerable people, like the, like just enslaving Indians to mine your gold in the Caribbean or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the idea that the Indians are subhuman, so they are meant to be enslaved. And so the, the racist ideology is that this, this different racial group or whatever is subhuman in some way. So it's meant to justify uh, an, a system of uh, sin against justice uh, to justify this type of thing. So I, I, I think of it in a, in a historical context. Um, and I see that developing, especially in the American, in the United States, developing in, in the, the Protestant culture where you don't have intermarriage um like i see in the spanish colonial there, there was racism you know that you had the full-blood spaniards who are basically racist against more, the mestizos of, of the the lower classes who are all intermarrying with the indians they're all creating this sort of new culture and so that racism sort of de de devolves a, a, to a great ex great extent among the spanish um the popular culture because they all have one cult the the sacrifice of the mass they have matrimony which is one cult so they're united in one culture they're marrying each other they're having children who are mixed race and so they're all sort of mixing together in this one culture whereas the more elites who are full blood spaniards are more racist or whatever but the racism is very much mitigated because of this one catholic culture whereas in in the united states you have the protestant different cults of protestantism sects of protestantism that don't mix as well with the Indians and the Africans in, because you even have the, uh, you've got the Creole cultures also that, that are mixtures of, of the Africans and the Spaniards and the Indians all together. And they get caught but, in the crossfire all the time. My, my wife is mixed. Uh, she's half Asian. Her mom was born and raised in Korea and she's experienced it firsthand. You know, this kind of groupishness that, that sees you uh, as passing. That's the, the code word now, right? It's kind of like being a white Hispanic <laughs> that, that you, you pass for this and therefore you are problematic. Another catch word for it. And I can jive with your definition of that, the dehumanizing dynamic of that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess I, I can see that first of all, but then in, in the 19th century, you have the two, uh, opposing forces you have the one in the abolition move um, abolitionist movement in the 19th century which especially picks up steam in in these two protestant societies which are america and the united states or i'm sorry united states and britain british empire um and and on the other hand the opposing force of that is the evolutionary darwinism darwinism eugenics movement which is exalting even more any any amount of racism that existed before that it exalts it even further into this eugen the eugenics movement which was even big big in the united states the early 20th century where everybody was taking darwin's ideas more and more to you know people were uh, lining up to figure out what their gene pool was to see how much better they were than everybody else because it was also about the survival of the fittest and and then you obviously have nazism out of that so this whole eugenics racist ideology of of uh the superiority of a certain uh dna basically over right. other dna you know at, at least darwin's successors you know social darwinism you know but the the uh i think there's a meaningful distinction that you kind of hint at here between racism and culturism and th there are some excellent books on culturism but the idea that culture being a set of uh, values and histories, um, ideas, worldviews that are clashing with each other and that these have overlap, you know, and we see this within the, the Catholic worldview, for example. I mean, we're a global, <laughs> we're a global church. You, you know, it's not like, it's not like just a bunch of white people believe in Catholicism, you know, not even close. And so you can see the overlap 
with this, with culturism, and that some cultures can, and in fact are, can be and are, in fact, uh, superior. And you yeah. can say that without without having any kind of racial prejudice whatsoever. And that's a very important point, because there is such a thing as civilization, and there is such a thing as barbarism. And, and, that's, and that's one of the difficulties with the clash between the European and African cultures right here, because the state that the African, at least the West Africans, I mean, we're talking about different, there's different Africas. I mean, there's Egypt and there's, you know, there's, there was, um, what was it? Timbuktu. I can't remember. There was some, there was some Mohammedan universities in Africa. Uh, so there was a great deal of, even though it was Mohammedan civilization, it's still civilization versus just straight barbarism, like animism and, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, in the bush and all this type of savagery basically versus, um, there's, you know, the civilization of the Ethiopia, uh, there's Alexandria, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 also, there's, there. there's a yeah. great deal of civilization in Africa, but a great number of the Africans that were transplanted were not civilized, basically, you know, they were, they were, you know, more or less savages, just like much many Indians were, and some Indians were not, again, these are all like, there's so many different aspects to it historically. I mean, there was savage Indians and there were more civilized Indians more Indians who are more amenable to um, the culture, but because of Christianity and not because Europeans are white or because Europeans are superior in any way. In fact, uh, you know, our ancestors were very barbaric, terrible people, honestly. Savage. Um, savage. <laughs> they were savage, but right, right, it was right. the gospel. The mm. gospel civilized our ancestors. And it's not because Europeans are great race. It's because Christianity is the true faith. That's the reason the European civilization has su far surpassed every other civilization, simply because of Christianity. Um, and so there, th I, I think that's a really great distinction between racism on the one hand, which is uh, you, cannot, you cannot judge any man as subhuman because of his DNA alone. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you can judge the truth of the gospel and the civilizations that it has created. Uh, and this would, like I said, this would include certain African civilizations like Ethiopia and whatnot um, as superior to a barbarous or, you know, savage civilization, which has not been exposed to the gospel. So there is a definitely a hierarchy there. And we see it every time Christianity uh, has confronted uh, different cultures, right? I mean, you have it even with the Vikings, you know, it, the, the way that the, the pagans were uh, in pre-Christendom and the kind of things that they were involved with, right? And uh, the cults that, the, and the practices that they were involved with and how that's changed, you know? Yeah, I think, and then there's another, uh, even a further distinction that's another difficulty too, because I think, we need to break it down a little bit even further because there is a hierarchy between all men. And, w and when I say all men, I mean all people, human beings, men, women, and children. Uh, I mean, there's a distinction, first of all, between men and women. There is a hierarchy there, uh, differences and strengths and weaknesses on both sides. But also just considering all just males, all males of any race or all women of all race or any, any race is still going to have, they're still going to be hierarchies of merit where one man is skilled in this thing and another man is intelligent in this area and there is still a hierarchy between what each man has in his natural gifts in his the grace the the you know certain people are graced with greater gifts from god in in this or that area so there's there's always a hierarchy um and saint thomas says that hierarchy is the ordering of things that are unequal and yeah. it is the the term hierarchy means sacred order and p peace is defined as the tranquility of order and so you if you understand that there is truly a hierarchy there are people who are better at this thing or better than that thing and and we acknowledge that and and we just we uh we conform ourselves to the hierarchy and i depend on my brother who is better at xyz than than i or he may depend on me if I'm gifted in this area, then he's not. And we can actually work together and have this hierarchy and this tranquility of order. That, I think, now that is also rests, however, on a, a pure equality of human dignity, which is sort of 
uh, in the very substance of humanity, every every man, woman, and child has that, no matter who you are and what you have or don't have. I so, think ideally, but I think natural aristocracy, you know, it's it's a transcultural. You know, it's um in every in every place and time, you're going to have um, leaders rise to the top. <laughs> and sometimes it's not because they're pious and devout people. Sometimes it's the scumbags that end up at the top. But they're they're also talented people, clever, crafty. And so, you know, those are those are uh, gifts, right? <laughs> Blessings and curses. And uh, and sometimes those things uh, come to the top and, and not always for terrible reason. In fact, some of those people may end up being OK uh, for the time. I think President Trump might be an example <laughs> of this, you know, but um. Yeah, the idea that that people have different have have different skill sets. They have uh, different ways of looking at the world and analyzing particular situations and foreseeing certain outcomes and preparing certain ways. And that this, in a very, it's a natural aristocracy that kind of fleshes itself out. And even the people, it's inevitable. You know, even the people who the the hardcore levelers, the ones that are like, no. We need to get rid of all the hierarchy. It's inherently wicked. We all need to just be <laughs> on the level plane. Uh, they even have leaders and opinion makers and, you know, the way that media flows, this kind of two way flow that goes between uh, people who make the news and people who receive and absorb the news and echo what they're saying. And just look at the way that any group that tries to buck that right and say, well, I don't believe that I'm going to. I'm going to try to live a life of leveling with a community of people like that. Those things don't last, man. They fall apart. Look at every congregational church in the world. <laughs> and it's like a bazillion different denominations because all their votes are equal. So if somebody isn't on board, they're like, somebody's got to make the decision then, right? On, well, how much is necessary for us to move forward and, and everything else? And how dare you come against me kind of thing? And it just falls apart. Look at all the hippie communes, man. You know, hippie communes, them buggers just they fall apart like crazy. And so um, natural aristocracy, hierarchy, uh, uh, hierarchical constructs are inevitable um, globally, space and time. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I, I really like that because it, it illustrates the fact that there must be hierarchy to maintain a stable culture of any kind. And the first culture is in the family between the man and the woman and the children and the children must obey the hierarchy if they're able if they're going to have any stable unity with the past generations whatsoever um, yeah. yeah and so look, I at think, the, look at the people who <laughs> say they don't believe that i'm sorry for cutting you off there but go ahead you think think of the people you know i i know i know a bazillion of them i was part of the atheist community and it's a it's a plague over there this idea where it's like well we're not religious because we don't indoctrinate our children just read their Facebook pages, man. <laughs> like, look at where they're bringing their kids. You know, they, they painted a sign with us to go to these rallies and protests and everything. And we did this chant over and over. This is what democracy looks like over and over and over. And I'm like, you don't see that's a mantra, dude. You don't see that when you put a sign out in front of your yard that says, you know, in this house, we believe, and they've norm they've got like a list oh, yeah, of we believe things. in science. <laughs> yeah, science is real, <laughs> kindness is everything. Yeah. If they don't think that's a creedal and even a covenantal statement, they're ignorant. Yeah, that's and, just a fact. And that's and that's the the Lutheran principle cannot survive because you can't pass down to your children rebellion against authority. Yeah. Try doing that and see what happens. Right. And that's what we've seen. Yeah. Uh, so I think in the 19th century, there's, there's this, this is when there, there's this, there's this worldwide rebellion against tyrant Kings, uh, you know, tyrants who are flaunting the church and there's a massive reaction, you know, the American revolution, all that, but there's the abolitionist movement, but then at the same time, the, so the abolitionist movement is definitely a cause of justice long overdue against the injustice of robbing Africans of, of their home and everything and enslaving them for generations and generations. But the, the, many of these abolitionists were also the proto-feminists. In, in 1848, the, the, the uh, Seneca Falls Convention, those mm -hmm. feminists were abolitionists. And so they were this whole mix of an effort towards justice was mixed in with a, just a rebellion against all hierarchy whatsoever, starting with the hierarchy between men and women. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that you see that same thing when you when you go forward a hundred years after that into the the 20th century civil rights movement in the 1960s, you see a lot of great good where the civil rights movement is working against a real in, real injustice, which is that had been you know perpetuated in the United States with Jim Crow. But it's mixed with a great deal of rebellion against all authority whatsoever. You know, so Bayard Rustin was one of the early gay rights uh, guys, and he was one of the close uh, close collaborators with Martin Luther King. And uh, so he he was trying to overturn sodomy laws and things like that. Um, and obviously in the 1960s, there was all manner of rebellion against everything. So it was a, just a great mix of this just evil on the one hand and good. And so that's, that's what makes it really difficult. And especially in, and when we address our, these riots, uh, it's very difficult to wade through the good from the bad and true justice. And especially when obviously the media is uh, all about news speak and not about truth. Mm-hmm. But it, it requires it though. It requires recognizing uh, the good and with the same amount of force to recognize the, the Trojan horse to some of this, you know, and we'll talk about it when we talk about black lives matter. I mean, there's, there are some things, I mean, people could go through uh, tr- certain traditional Catholics could go through some of their uh, ideas and go, well, with that, it doesn't sound half bad, but then you get to the clause, right? You get to, <laughs> you get to the description and saying like, well, why, why this? And you, you, you get to their rationale behind it. And, uh, and boy, that's that's bad. That's Pandora's box. And so, you know, to recognize that somebody could do something um, for all intents and purposes good, and yet at the same time, their motivation and what else is coming in its train could be bad. And in fact, that's a that's a narrative of history. Um, it seems like that's the way things just constantly go. It's never like, well, we we finally came to the good part, and now all the bad is gone. It's like every time we make an advancement there's new problems that we got to deal with and new puzzles we got to figure out morally uh, legally stuff like that and so um you know but i know we'll talk about that of course when we talk about black lives matter uh, the rioting antifa and all that yeah the, so the the democratic party was i mean there there was a time i think when the democratic party was uh seeking I mean, I think of Sergeant Shriver, who was the brother-in-law of JFK. Now, JFK was not a good Catholic, uh, but Sergeant Shriver was, and he was a pious man, and he was a, he was a Democrat, and he was actually this was the the age of the war on poverty. I think that no, that was Lyndon B. Johnson, but he he created the Peace Peace Corps. Uh, Sergeant Shriver did, so he was trying to use tax dollars, and you know, you can everyone can disagree with that if you want, whatever. But he was still a pious Catholic trying to do good and help the poor. And uh, I think there was a time when the Democratic Party was a little bit more amenable to Catholics. But there were, at some point, the Democratic Party threw in their lot with the sexual revolution. And they wanted to, they wanted to end, they wanted to care for the poor, but then destroy marriage. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens that marriage is the greatest weapon against poverty ever. Yeah. And this is this is what is killing the poor is that they don't get married they they no longer have dual income they don't no longer have a stable father they no longer have a lifetime monogamy they've got uh promis- promiscuity where children are abandoned to poverty because the parents are not together they're not providing for each other um and so the left and the democratic party they want to help the poor without defending marriage and without defending the unborn for that matter of course uh the most, the poorest of the poor. And so, which is a massive contradiction. And this is the type of insanity that makes pro-lifers just incredibly enraged, especially because there is so much talk about black, black lives matter, but there is a complete absence of the unborn black lives Mm -hmm. that are being especially targeted. As we know, talking about racism, Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, huge eugenicist and racist who wanted to kill black people. Uh, yeah. It's terrible. It's the um, societal sadomasochism of utopians, you know, deconstructionists, the kind of 
revolutionary spirit in a way of the godless, the covenant breaker that believes, you know, we, I'm trying to do this, this good thing. Um, but for a reason that is, uh, uh, premised right. And that presupposes a worldview that is covenant breaking. It's revolutionary. And no matter what they end up doing, um, it's going to be self-destructive. It's sadomasochistic. Um, and it's and it's premised on guilt manipulation, not just of other people, but even of themselves. And so, you know, you're always going to see this where on the one hand, they're like, well, look, we want to we want to uh, focus on Black Lives Matter is that to use the example that you brought up. And yet nowhere on the platform for Black Lives Matter. And I want to I, I should stress this um, is that Black Lives Matter is the name of an organization. <laughs> OK, it is the name of a specific group. Um, and disagreeing with Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that you oppose Black Lives any more than opposing the Patriot Act means that you're unpatriotic. I mean, that's just it's pure. That's super easy to understand. No, but the idea, no the that's idea, very hard to understand, actually. Uh, well, the idea, you <laughs> unfortunately. know, yeah. Un well, unfortunately for a lot of people, I, I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's hard to understand. I think it's hard for people to get to the place where they even begin to do the thinking required to understand anything. Right. And, and I'm that's, sorry for being such yeah. a jerk about that. No, but I no, just, that's it's on is, parade right now. This <laughs> is the reality of, of yeah. news speak. That's what the quote I put in the show notes of this episode is from George Orwell when he discusses what news speak is designed to do. News speak is designed to do your thinking for you. Mm -hmm. It's designed to manipulate the language so that you don't have to think at all. You just kind of move with the tide. And that's exactly what has been going on for decades now. Yeah, I saw this, you know, I, I was thinking about this before college, but when I went to journalism school, I mean, it was like right in my face because we have these books, the style and usage. In fact, I've got, let me reach over here. It's a video show. I can do this. So th this is an old version of it, but this is the Associated Press style book, uh, a briefing on media law, fully revised and updated. I'm trying to, I don't remember what year this is. It's a while back. But anyway, this is what we had to use for, for college. And so you can look in here and look up anything. You know, while I open to United Nations, look at this. I talk about Newspeak. Uh, it says, spell out when you use as a noun. Use u dot n dot, no space, only as an adjective. It gives all the de definitions of things and how you're supposed to use them when you're placing them in different contexts and situations. Um, but the way that that is manipulated, right, and the way, I, you know, I was in school when they were saying no longer use the phrase illegal immigrants. No longer use that. Use undocumented workers. And the idea that that is not social engineering is totally ridiculous. I mean, you know, you're talking about the, the Associated Press. You're talking that that's what goes out all over the place. You know, whenever a newspaper is is trying to fill space and they don't have original writing, they're, they're pumping it with Associated Press. It goes to all the radio stations and everything else. It's kind of the standard in a lot of ways. Um, and so we saw this recently where I believe the Associated Press again was telling journalists no longer use the term looter or looting. Instead, just say stole because they were saying looting comes up with a whole bunch of different um, cultural uh, kind of discriminatory dynamic to that, you know. And so they were like, we, we just need to use the word stole. And they gave an example of it and stuff. And so you see this all the time in the way that people are allowed to talk about groups, but it's not just the way that they're changing certain words, but the way that they're introducing certain phrases too into the population. Now, in your experience, Jeremiah, as a journalist, it, it appears for, to me from kind of the outside, being a non-journalist and just reading the news and whatnot, I, it appears to me that there's a combination of machinations from the elites who are actually pulling strings and, and sort of creating the orthodox language to socially engineer the populace and, and engineer consent as the, the phrase from Ed Bernays. Uh, and then on the other hand, there's also just sort of a group think mentality too, where the herd is just sort of following like a mob and they just follow, sort of follow what the, what the great emotionalism uh, leads. Uh, so it seems like there's a combination of those two happening. So my question for you is, would you agree with those two factors kind of, at work to create the news speak phenomenon um, and how much power do each, each of those have in your mind? What do you think? Well, I think it's top down. 
you know, I, I think I don't think that there's a, a symbiotic relationship between the masses, you know, influencing the the newspapers and the leaders to change their their talk. You know, and and, and whenever that does happen, uh, it, it would always be institutional. You know, it, it would always be organized. It'd be some kind of an activist outfit, some kind of a lobbying enterprise. Uh, and, and I would include within the lobbying enterprise, uh, uh, big Hollywood stuff, you know what I mean? Um, and so oh. the way that they peddle that, the way that they attempt to manufacture consent based on, based on their own sense of, of elite values. And this isn't new, right? In fact, there's a, a, a decent argument. There's a book, um, secular age, uh, by Charles Taylor that, that describes the history of uh, the way that ethics kind of come down in language the way it comes down from the elites and that that the higher up that the the peasants came right there was a demand on them to flesh out that kind of fear and trembling for their salvation right with the elite values which we now uh, describe as being politically correct but i think that that the media plays as a kind of middleman in a way um they um they love each other on the one hand they're a they're a ridiculous bubble but even within that bubble, there's a hierarchy and and they they fawn over celebrities, whether Hollywood or whether D.C., whether New York, L.A., doesn't matter that international like the Greta Thunbergs of the world, um, that those that those groups, there's a, a fetishizing of them. There's an idolizing of these people and those individuals and those belief systems right, of the, the globalist elite influence. Uh, coming down and put put societal pressures and and uh, moral pressures kind of cross pressures in fact on journalists and and media enterprises that begin to embrace and adopt and of course that's the top down too it's not they don't change their style book by a democratic vote <laughs> you know even that's top down man and so you know that's how i think it happens and i, I want to say one more thing about it is that that when i was in journalism school, you know, I, I was one of the few, in fact, I, I was the only conservative and traditional person um, that I knew in the whole J school program. And I remember bringing that question up and, and there's, there are stories that journalists like to tell themselves. Number one, that it's diverse, right? And there's a, a blind spot. And even when you bring up the lack of diversity and say, I'm the only conservative here, there's always an escape hatch for those things. Um, and one of them uh, most of them are illegit, but one is actually legit. And that is that more uh, people who have certain personality types and moral foundations that would be interested in investigation and controversy and going and, and uh, digging up the dirt and all that, and also aspiring to the elite, right? Combined with that, um, that, that kind of person is uh, typically a leftist. I mean, it's just <laughs> whether it's power, whether it's fetishizing the elite and aspiring to that, um, whatever it is, that it draws them to that. And there just weren't many people. Uh, as I said, I was the only one. I mean, I didn't even have a buddy. <laughs> I had no pal in J school. No, it seems like to me, media, it, it's, I think um, Edward R. Murrow, is he a good, good guy in your book? No. No, bad guy? Well, in terms of irrational political discourse, no, no? <laughs> uh, you know, is he, I see the beginning of the. I mean, I, was there a time when when their media was a ra providing a rational discourse for the public? He was a predecessor to what we have now, right? With, with the opinion talk, and in fact, I encourage every single person watching this right now to to look up not not right now. You don't don't leave here. Watch watch the rest of the show, but afterward, you know, take a note of this, okay? It's called Best of Enemies. It's a documentary uh, about William Buckley Jr. Um, and uh, oh, Gore Vidal and the debate that they had during the, the, the convention, the Republican uh, convention during the riots and everything else is kind of you know relevant for right now, kind of the things going on surrounding that. And uh, it talks about how prior to that, the news was always just a single shot during conventions. And that they would just play the whole time with one screen, with one shot, one camera, whatever was going on, even the breaks and stuff. So it was super boring. It was a little bit like C-SPAN, but just all the time. It just never stopped. And so um, that year, 
I forget which which broadcasting group it was, but they had this idea to bring in someone from the right and someone from the left. Never happened before. Right. And when they brought them in, uh, Buckley said he would not do it. He would do it except for one one person. He said, I will not be on there if Vidal is on there. So the first thing they did is go to Vidal. Right. Bring him on. And long story short, they they uh, went at it day after day after day. And every single day, Vidal was trolling him and, and just goading him every day. Uh, and calling him a crypto fascist. And finally, he finally snapped. And I have a, I have a clip of it, I think on um, either Paleo Radio or Paleocrat, one of the two on YouTube, a clip of that, that changed news forever, where Buckley looks at him and he says, you stop, you know, basically you stop calling me a crypto Nazi or I'm going to sock you in the GD mouth. And he says it right on TV, right? And he says, and you'll, you'll land on the floor and you'll stay plastered. And I mean, you got to imagine that voice and the dignity of, Buckley Jr. <laughs> and and but but Vidal knew he had him and everybody freaked. All the news stations freaked until the ratings came in. And from that point forward, news was never the same. Ah, uh, okay. And so I it, in fact I saw it in the theaters a bunch of times and it it, it brought me to tears because it's it, you know, growing up, I mean we're we're close to the same age, growing up where we've in the times that we've grown up in, it's like that's the water we're in. You know, we don't we don't really know much outside of that. And to see that the, how that happened, and and Murrow, I think, was a predecessor to that. He had kind of his solo mic to just opine mm-hmm. and to and to shroud it as news. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, just for our non-American viewers, Edward R. Murrow was, I believe, in the 1950s and 60s, but it was during the McCarthy era of America, where there was a great deal of anti-communist. Uh, push to root out the communist infiltration, which was actually going on in the U.S. government and all over the world. Um, but he was basically ruthless, uh, and critics would would say it was far, you know, as excessive. And Edward Edward R. Murrow was one of his critics, and so he was mm-hmm. he was a newscaster, and he he was he would have his uh, nightly news where he would basically just kind of uh, critique this whole program and and. Uh, create this type of more opinion news uh and what year was this uh kind of turning point that you're talking about is that uh, are we in the 1970s it's at this point nixon man it's okay nixon. yeah so so and then yeah. william f nixon buckley the riots we was in chicago so, yeah. okay yeah so f buckley again for um anyone who doesn't know william f buckley was the founder, founder of the of national national, national review uh i believe in early seventies or late sixties. I don't recall the year for that, but it, it was a conservative news organization mm. and he led that for, m- for many years. He and was the host uh, of firing line, which is a great show, by the way, it's got some really great, great interviews and debates. I've always found it a fascinating thing. Yeah. And, and if sure. Buckley was a, was a Catholic, um, yeah. tri- actually preferred the Latin mass. I heard him say once on Fireland line at the time, the Latin mass was almost unheard of. Um, but uh, yeah, I think he has um, Michael Davies on one of his recordings. Yeah, he, had Davies, but he also had yeah. what's his name, man? Who's the? Yeah, uh, he had like a blood, a, the, the blood a liberal speaker. priest. Was it Malachi versus... Martin? Oh, did he have? Malachi? Yeah, Malachi. I believe yeah. Malachi was uh, on staff at National Review for a while. Uh, he yeah, was kind so... of their, their religion guy, and he, you know, there was it was one other thing I was going to say. About, oh, Buckley was also the um, honorary. Uh, president or uh, you know honorary founder kind of of the young americans for freedom in fact the founding document for young americans for freedom of which i used to serve as the the president for olivet young americans for freedom um he was that statement that is their kind of founding document uh, was drafted i believe at his house yeah and uh, it's interesting that you said that about the media because that um, the other aspect of that is that in the civil rights movement, because the nonviolent, uh, at least the Martin Luther King's nonviolent movement, it got, you know, splinter groups came out as well with the like the um, student nonviolent protests of the the uh, bus uh, ride ins and all that. Um, but it was really the media that made the civil rights movement successful because the media was able to broadcast these nonviolent protesters getting beaten and beaten to the pulp by these whatever racist sheriffs or whatever. And they were able to broadcast throughout the world that this was happening, which put pressure on the federal government to then impose uh, 
you know, send in the National Guard, basically. Yeah. Uh, you know, if the media had not been there, I think that, you know, these protesters would have just been crushed and that was it. That would have been it. I mean, that's happened throughout history. Mm -hmm. this, this type of, you know, just the the people in power were able to just, just crush the opposition. And that was that. I mean, if the, the nonviolence only works if it can be broadcast throughout everybody else. And then the president of the United States gets embarrassed and has to enforce the national the National Guard. Uh, sort of a proxy, you know, the, it's the ir ironic thing with the nonviolence is that it requires a proxy violence. It requires this National Guard to come in and and impose something, impose law and order in order for it to work. Um, but it, it uses the media in particular to make that happen. Yeah, it was technological, uh, too. I mean, you know, it, I think there would have been great strides, probably even if we were still limited to the photograph, you know, if, if, if the photograph uh, or even the reels that would play, you'd go to the, the theaters, man, and you'd be able to walk in anytime and stuff like that and be there for a long time and watch the, the news reels that play. But, um, you know, or you're hearing it on radio, but radio would have had a limited effect, but being able to see video footage of it on the scene, right? So it's not like you're, you, you got a set and you got to stay there, but where you're able to go on location, same thing with Vietnam. You, know, oh, yeah. you see the impact that embedded sources had. And so you can see there's 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 a bust and boon to to this, not only with the news uh, and journalism, um, but also technology and and how that can be used on the one hand to show things that we're grateful for. And yet, on the other hand, um, can be the source of all too many hoaxes. You know, Mike Cernovich has a great movie detailing a lot of that. And uh, yeah, that, that's that's a that's a great point. Just I know that the media has been, I mean, the press as the newspaper became really powerful. I know in the 19th century, I don't know if it was even earlier than that. I know there was pamphleteers like in the, in the American Revolution, you know, uh, printing off their pamphlets and everything. But uh, yeah, that video footage is so powerful, and especially like you said with the Vietnam War. Um, but I think that's uh, you really. I don't know. I can't think of a time when there was a really a galvanizing media effect on the populace like there was in the 60s that really galvanized great swaths of the population to protests uh like it was in the 60s um i mean you really didn't have television uh i mean you had you had those war reels like you were, were discussing but i mean the situation we have now is we have a video of a white cop with his knee on a black man who later dies. And yeah, I, I never actually watched the photo, it, the video. Is there more context to that video? Jeremiah? Uh, there, there appears to be a small baggie of some drugs dropped out behind him. And, it, um, and I, I, I encourage people to go to conservative treehouse.com. They have an article uh, just a couple days ago, Sunday talks crump, which is the, the lawyer uh, for the Floyd family. Uh, Crump on Floyd, we don't understand where uh, they go into the possibility. In fact, and, and I think there's a, a compelling amount of of evidence pointing to this that and, and it seems like the lawyer even kind of grants this, that the the officer, right, that he and Floyd knew each other. And in fact, that even the people who were there knew him um, and that it all goes back to to this place called the uh, El Nuevo Rodeo, which is in all likelihood a front uh, for an alphabet NATSEC group <laughs> and with, with counterfeit money, which is what he was called on. And so there was a question, a reasonable question as to uh, whether or not uh, this officer and Floyd himself, if they were involved in some way uh, with operations that we know are already happening in that area. And in fact, even specifically related to to where they both worked, okay? Because they both worked there, you know, they both worked at the at that on the way of a rodeo. And so, um, you know, there's a lot there's a lot going on. And by the way, I, I should say this: I think it's at least possible not only why the officer wasn't charged in what 2006, uh, but also um, it would it would expose the massive operation um, printing. By the way. Like what was it? Nine hundred thousand one dollar bills. I mean, that's ridiculous. The the idea has to be tracing, because nobody nobody who's gonna do 
<laughs> Who's gonna do one dollar bills, man? Nine hundred thousand one dollar bills. You're not, yeah. even, you're not even worth it. I'd like to get into a little bit more of the context, but th- just a reminder uh, to I don't know I don't know if this got more international, um, but the in America I believe it was last year or the year before there was a video that came out of uh, Nick Sandman, the uh, the white mm-hmm. like seventeen year old who was confronted by this Indian activist Mm -hmm. and that that created a massive media uh media fueled uh gal just protest and then and his own bishop disowned him Mm -hmm. and then it came out later there was more videos and it it turned out that the indian sort of instigated this whole thing totally did and and the the white guy you know this this young kid just kind of stood there and actually as far as I can tell, acted admirably given the tension of the situation. He didn't provoke anything. Um, and so, you know, when we have, I, I mean, I don't know the whole context and nobody knows the whole context, very few, at least very few of us. And, and certainly none of all these, you know, these rioters, people who are just causing this violence, how many of them actually know the whole story about George Floyd, his background or what was the situation uh, what was everything going on? If if the if the cop actually did murder him, then he sh- he will stand trial, and that will come out in a in the due process of the justice system, and that should he should be given the justice he deserves. And if he he was using excessive force or whatever or whatever happened, um, that should all be taken into consideration and, and examined. But we cannot make a judgment on. It, it's hard to make too strict a judgment on the situation when we have uh you know the a, a video without any context of the the whole situation so uh it, it seems to be played out as yeah. if it were just a purely cold-blooded murder well everyone was it was like a gang murder basically is is it is how it's being portrayed maybe that's the case maybe it's true it could come very well be a total gang murder by cops yeah, let's just like that could be the case and it could it not could be the be. case yeah. I, I i don't even know i mean i what no. we do know uh we do we know george floyd had you know multiple felonies uh did this cop have a bunch of corruption in his own past I, was this a, just a perfect storm i don't know i don't know well, what, I, I think i think well we're not going to be able to to dodge forever the idea that the fact not the idea that the officer and floyd knew each other that they worked at the same place and that that Floyd was actually okay with being arrested at first. The problem arose when he was getting into going to be put in with Floyd. Now, Floyd was the security officer. Okay. At this, this front house, this front group. Okay. So he, there's a possibility that we're talking about, you know, kind of the guy that fixes the situation. I mean, if, if Floyd is using if and these are ifs, but if Floyd is using uh, counterfeit money, because remember the El Nuevo was closed because of lockdown, you'd be super dupe suspicious if you're still pumping out stuff <laughs> during lockdown and you got your, you know, the the, the payroll. It's like, oh, you're still open. Uh, you're a but you're a cantina and stuff. And so, so they're closed. Well, he ain't making loot. He's not making money. And so all of a sudden, he gets a bunch of counterfeit money. Well, ain't that susp- suspicious? And that this guy working with them. And remember, this officer uh, had multiple investigations, not just one. I mean, it goes back it, it more than like 13, 15 different investigations. Someone that that there are a host of different issues, and somehow it goes away, including the very confusing fact. And a lot of people have said, "I don't understand this. How is it that the the medical people that have looked at it said there's no sign?" of asphyxi- uh, asphyxiation from this that that's not how he died you know so people are watching something and then they're like well how, what's this all about so it'll be interesting to see how this goes it'll be interesting to see what directions uh crump decides to go in court and i think there's a reason why he's just looking at the restitution right? he doesn't want to go too deep into different things but and, and he, but he admits that there's stuff that he doesn't understand including the fact that they knew each other and what is the level of that involvement and the extent of what he admitted was, well, there's stuff that we don't really understand. That's a big admission in my opinion. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see what happens to this, but no matter what, I mean, even if that's the case, 
It's not right. I mean, it's, it's not saying that it's a good thing. Like, oh, okay, the enforcer took him out so that the Alphabet Soup group didn't get busted for their counterfeit <laughs> scheme in Minnesota. You know, <laughs> like that doesn't play itself out that way. It's still something that that people could be outraged about, but it's still funneled in to a series of hoaxes, a series of these media manipulations. Trayvon Martin. I mean, we've all seen it. We've all seen Trayvon. There's a documentary. People can go right now and you can hear Trayvon's girlfriend, right? Not Trayvon's girlfriend, uh, talking to the people, her handlers, essentially, admitting that she doesn't know Jack about this and that she, she you know, it's, it's hard for her. And then they actually, the documentarian found the girlfriend. I don't know if her name was Diamond or Dynasty, some kind of, it sounds almost like a porn name, but, you know, found her interviewed her in real life right and so found his actual girlfriend but remember the pictures the pictures were all from like years before with you know a childlike face real boyish and everything uh and not current because the current ones weren't good same thing with uh michael brown with hands up don't shoot i mean we're seeing this right now you're hearing it at all these 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 riots hands up don't shoot that is a phony a phony narrative it's not true journalistically speaking it is fake you've been faked if you believe that but they say well it doesn't matter because it's the narrative can you, can you explain what happened there with the with the hands up don't shoot yeah, michael brown it was uh uh michael brown gets shot he's uh, not a good dude right he's on video uh acting super brutal uh to a uh convenience store owner as he's thieving stealing well, well i won't say looting he's stealing from there um and then he gets into an altercation with the with the police officer and come to find out uh even under the obama administration right even even with holder admitting this that that uh brown went for his gun okay and and that what was what was said and everything else that they said it was no hands up don't shoot no okay, so there. the so the prosecution against the cop who shot him yeah. admitted that Michael Brown went for his gun. Oh, it was determined. It was yeah. determined. Yeah, yeah. But but before but before that was determined in the court of law, the media had already decided that he said, "Hands up, don't shoot." Yes, that... they peddled it. And in fact, if you go back to that documentary, I I I, I wish I could, I should just look it up right now. But it's it's a documentary about Trayvon Martin. And you 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 hear and you get to to understand the role that that high profile journalists play in intentional misinformation. It is it is a the means the ends justify the means with this. They say right. well it's a, it's a greater cause. Um, Marxist. Totally yeah. yes, and it's the same thing with uh, you know a, a lot of the riots. It's the same thing with uh, trying to get Trump out with all the. Uh, different you know russia gate and ukraine gate and <laughs> pp gate and, you know everything else in the sun uh, under the sun with this that it's always there's there's a goal in mind and and that engineering is the purpose because ultimately we they don't believe and this is just a fact they number one they believe that they're playing a bigger role and uh you know even the guy is to peddle the dossier right uh the the there's certain journalists that were used to peddle that and were eventually kind of played into the the FISA and everything else to go with Carter Page with Russiagate. But they believe that they're playing a role. They're, they believe that they are doing a great thing, working alongside with national security. Um, sometimes maybe they're lied to. Sometimes they lie to themselves. A lot of times they lie to everybody. And that is just that is just a fact of our reality. And it's so easy now because you you can manipulate with angles, with emphases, with with um, certain words that are selected, the way that you can record things over. Look again, you Brenton, uh, the the MAGA hat kid, right? The one punch him in the face. I've never seen a more punchable face in my life. That kid, right? That won a huge sum of money, by the way. Millions, <laughs> millions, bro. Yeah. Bravo, bravo. And um, but but look at that. Look at how they could take that, and then and, and then uh, amplify that via social media. That, that has a preference for institutions, what they call th these reliable sources, right? Um, that, well, it's reliable media. And those groups amplify it. It trends. The, the plebs start sharing it. 
right? All over the place. And, and it gets ingrained. I mean, we saw that last thing I'll say about it. We saw that just recently with the, the picture that was going around social media with uh, uh, Adolf Hitler holding a Bible in his hand and Donald Trump holding the Bible in his hand. That picture of Hitler has no Bible in its, in his hand. Okay. And one guy I, I responded to conveniently removed it. <laughs> he removed the, the tweet. My, my reply is still there, but the tweet is gone. And, and there's no apology, no retraction. And even if there was, it wouldn't get nearly the traction that the original tweet got. Yeah, that's a really good point about means to an end because they, the communists and the Marxists and the Alinskyites are all thinking that they can lie for a greater good. And that is what justifies their lies because in their mind, they're working for a greater justice and the revolution, blood, bloodshed is, is necessary for the revolution in their mind, even bloodshed. And if bloodshed is necessary, then certainly lies are, are no big deal. So uh, that's a really good point. What do you see? Uh, let's talk about Black Lives Matter and Antifa um, and George Soros and all this. You know, there are these machinations seeking to overturn every last vestige of any sort of Christian order whatsoever. Uh, and all the, let all the Muslims take over as well, by the way. We'll, we'll throw that in, too. Um, so what can you explain what it what is black lives matter what is antifa what are the things yeah well i've got uh, police one.com has a decent uh, description of antifa antifa short for anti-fascist or anti-fascism action is a radical far left leaning political movement made up of mostly autonomous groups which doesn't mean they're not organized right it just they're it would be like saying that the Eastern Orthodox don't have any kind of organizational construct. Um, but these groups spread throughout the United States. Uh, the movement has ties to anarchism, other radical left groups, like by any means necessary. Um, and so uh, also known as BAM uh, and is known for its militant presence at protests. Uh, some of the better known loosely organized Antifa groups include Torch Antifa, Antifa Sacramento in New York City Antifa. And as for Black Lives Matter, Right Side News, I think people should go check that out. Uh, look up uh, online, look up Black Lives Matter, Right Side News. Um, established in 2013 in response to the acquittal of the man who killed the black Florida teenager, Trayvon Martin. Okay, there we are with this, by the way. Again, this is <laughs> playing into, this is a, a creation from something that uh, was fake. Right? Something not even real. And you can go see the documentary. Um, it seeks to stoke black rage over the uh, virulent anti-black racism that, quote unquote, permeates our society, says America was originally built on indigenous genocide um, and slavery and continues to thrive on the brutal exploitation of people of color. And it goes through they're against patriarchy and same thing with both of them uh, against the patriarchy, hierarchy, classicism. Oh, racism, okay. militarism, total Marxist. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and they're 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 uh, supportive of of things like the the black queer and trans, undo black undocumented immigrants, uh, black disabled people, uh, black who self identify along non traditional points of the gender spectrum. But it's 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 purely identitarian, uh, critical theory, critical race theory stuff. Now, is that are you reading those definitions from? Is there an so you said that Antifa? There's no official sort of uh, organization, although they are still organized. Yeah, Whereas yeah. is Black Li in is Black Lives Matter? Does that have an official sort of mission statement on their official website? Yeah, in is fact, uh, yeah, Black Lives Matter. There was um, I was just I just saw something recently. I don't know if I was watching. Yeah, BlackLivesMatter.com. There you go. So you, you can go. They have a a uh, on their website right now. Defund the police. <laughs> defund them defund uh, the police and, and, i'm sorry i just have to laugh i mean what are you gonna do when you yeah. actually have to call 911 then i mean which they do so, i mean um yeah, yeah. oh okay so yeah. in response yeah. to trayvon martin's murder uh build local whose mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes by combating counteract countering acts of violence creating space for black imagination and innovation and centering black joy we are winning immediate improvement in our lives. Uh, and this, this is like, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's just so sad. I mean, the, the, 
the poor, whether that's blacks, Hispanics, or white poor, like I said, they they need uh, marriage and Planned Parenthood out of their neighborhoods, and that's mm -hmm. the first step to improving their lives. Uh, they need the Catholic faith, and uh, all all this, uh, and they need to stop killing each other. Of course, I mean, but poverty just breeds violence against other poor. I mean, that's what poverty does. Poverty creates that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are uh, those are the the root causes that that we would identify um, white supremacy. And and I think that there is there is I I mean. I want to say I want to say this. There is such a I I believe definitely that there is some such a thing as white privilege, but let me define that very carefully. What I mean by that is there is such a thing as a dominant culture in any nation. There is a dominant culture. There's a language. We all speak English. If you don't speak English, you have to learn English. That's a culture. You have to conform to the culture. And I grew up learning English. I, I already know English. I don't need to learn it. So that's a privilege to, for that. I don't have to, you know, somebody coming an immigrant who doesn't know English, they have to learn English. So I have a uh, sort of some sort of white privilege. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I'm a man. I have, uh, my parents were middle-class. So I I've got all these things that I was born with that I have, but because of the Marxist mentality, the Marxist mentality says that if anybody has anything that's more than somebody else, then he kind of stole it from him. Now, to a, to a degree, that can be the case. Sometimes, if, you know, somebody has excessive wealth and they refuse to give to the poor and they refuse to support the community and, and that type of thing. That can be sort of a a, a truth. Um, but the Marxist mentality says that everybody has to be pure, pure equal. Um, I think that this is uh, the failure of multiculturalism is the idea that we need to accept, we, we cannot accept the fact that there is a dominant culture that everyone must assimilate to, to a certain degree. Everybody in any culture in order to, for economy to exist, everybody needs to speak the same language. There needs to be a certain amount of mores in terms of respect and courtesy and things like that. There's a dominant culture. Everybody has to assimilate to it. And so people who are minorities and don't have that by birth, they are at some disadvantage. There is some disadvantage for them because they have to assimilate to the culture. You know, you, you have a minority culture that's, it's more difficult. You're like an immigrant, you know? So there is a, there's definitely, I definitely agree that there is, I don't, I don't think it's rational to just deny all white quote unquote white privilege whatsoever. Like that white people have no extra leg up or whatever. But on the other hand, there's also many African-Americans who criticize their own African-American brothers for failing to just be responsible and seek after the opportunities that they do have and mm -hmm. marry and be committed to their spouse. And, you know, which is again, first step out of poverty and, and, you know, do what's necessary. Uh, but there's a lot of other difficulties. I mean, it's a, it's a very complex issue. It's, it's not just, <laughs> again, it's, it's far more complex than the news speak. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I, I've, uh, I have friends, or at least one. Let me let me put it let me put it properly. I have a friend who is a very devout member of the Nation of Islam, and that is his message all the time. He goes onto the streets and he's dressed, you know, all all sorts of proper, looking nice, well kept, you know, shaved, looking at, dressed kind of like you actually, right? <laughs> More like you and less like me, you know. He's not quite a hippie, but he's uh, you know goes out and, and he talks about marriage, talks about children, talks about, um, you, you know, culture, talks about uh, uh, even things to do with food, right? And eating. And he's even interested in things like land and, and studying uh, mathematics and other things that are like, look, we have to understand science. And we have to understand mathematics. We can, you know, this isn't the time or place to criticize uh, why that doesn't play itself out in that worldview. <laughs> Let's just say it doesn't uh, with the alien spaceship and everything, Mothercraft, uh, you know, but um, we saw this recently just today. In fact, in Grand Rapids, uh, we had crazy riots. I mean, uh, downtown, tons of windows busted through. I mean, was it seven cop cars lit on fire? A whole bunch of pedestrian automobiles uh, lit on fire. And so they, they put a lockdown. But the thing is, the the um, chief of police went down today, met with with Black Lives Matter. Um, or at least a group that was organized with them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people. 
And they all got on a knee. And for, it had to be nine minutes. I should share the video with you. Maybe you can share it on Twitter. Uh, where for like nine minutes, they were, it was supposed to be a silent protest. But they had a megaphone. And, and they were saying, look, you know, we're going to, to yell out the words, uh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And, dude, they did it a mantra. I mean, it was just um, <laughs> remarkable to hear this and to watch to watch our law enforcement officials on their knees shouting this with the people. I, of course, I was on there telling them, get up off your knee, get out of there. It's a cult. Um, but the thing is, is that right after they were done, right after the cult was finished with what they were doing, a guy came up who who uh, was down with the, the movement. He was one of the people involved and they gave him the microphone. And he started saying the exact same thing that that we're saying, right? The exact same thing that the guy from the Nation of Islam is saying, uh, you, you know, and so talking about the culture, we need to, to, to have a different concept of responsibility, a different concept of sexual purity, a different concept, um, e even of how we present ourselves in in public. Right. And this applies not just to black people. And it, a lot of times they can say, well, yeah, you're, you're talking about my hair or my name or whatever. No, go back. And look up Marshall McLuhan and his conversation with college students. He's, he's in the center of an, this, this kind of auditorium. He's on a chair that's swiveling around with a microphone. And it's all dark, all around, like a big circle. And all around him are people. And questions will come from different sides of this, of this theater area. And one of them was asking his position about hippies and should they be able to dress the way they want to dress. He was a popular media theorist. He, wrote, he came up with the idea of uh, the medium is the message um, and hot and cool mediums. Um, and so the thing is, is that he said, no, he said, look, he said, I think everybody should be able to dress the way they want to dress, but people have to understand. And he's talking hippies. I mean, we're talking predominantly white people. He said, they have to understand that we are pattern recognizers and that we make snap judgments all the time. These, these heuristics that we got going on that, that will make judgments and, and determine kind of classify where people are and this can actually be a detriment to you and you can't get around that. I mean, it's in, it's in our bones, man. It's it where it's, it's uh, in who we are individually and societally. And that was a message that was not directed at black people it was directed at white people about white groups by a white guy. And that's just true of people in general. And so, you know, but that's the kind of thing that people are saying, sadly, those voices are not getting amplified by by the the mainstream media those voices um are being quelled those voices are being those are being marginalized right and so that's what's going on with that yeah uh the the free market uh free like free for all media manipulation does not profit from a rational patient discourse that is a ratings killer why, why would you ever do that <laughs> you you need yeah. you need flares of emotion you need uh sexualized content that's how you make the money and moving so. images i mean this plays right into money dude think about it i saw a house it was a house a number of years ago on our block that lit up on fire and it was just completely annihilated and I was going through the stuff with my daughter who had cancer at the time and she just got out of surgery and I was home. So my brain wasn't there. Right. But I went outside. I took pictures of what was going on. It's got some fantastic pictures, in fact. But when the news came, the local news, they asked me, they said, well, you you have you have uh, images. And I said, yes. And I was showing them that I had images and my friend had a video. Well, they wanted the video. They wanted that moving. And, and, and because it's fire, there's a sense that people are watching. And the people watching, there's a sense of relief that, man, I, it didn't happen to me. And they're watching destruction right in front of them. And there's, there's a power to that with moving images. And so having somebody on talking reasonably about pattern recognizing and cultural values and how that influences perception, <laughs> that's just totally boring. People are going to be like, I'm turning to SpongeBob, you know, and, and they're going to go there. It, but if it's fire, if it's bricks through a window, if it's if it's uh, police trying to retain order in a group or a person grabbing onto a truck that's blown through a crowd and they're getting run over, that stuff is going to play hot and you're going to have ratings through the roof and your group's going to make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. So we got uh, the media manipulation hoping to make a buck. We've got the Black Lives Matter and Antifa Marxists 
trying to uh, steal, kill, and destroy, whatever, create some kind of revolution. Do you think that they're they're trying? I mean, it seems like the COVID nineteen eighty four solution to Trump did not really work yeah, out. You know. So now they're just killing and burning and hoping that the, somehow that can create a situation. So like in 1968, they're the, the, the tumultuous year in the United States. Lyndon Johnson did not get reelected. He didn't even get the nomination. And Richard Nixon was elected campaigning on law and order uh, to try to quell all these riots and everything. It was a, a shift in the political landscape. Mm -hmm. Um do you what do you see is this is this the first i mean are, are, are these it seems like these anti-fa whatever these leftists i mean are just going to continue as much as they possibly can to try to desperately do something to prevent trump from being reelected or okay. trying to uh, mm -hmm. I, I i thought in 19, in 2019 last year i thought that this year would be bloodshed uh because of trump and what he represents yeah. as a as a he is a one of a number of presidents throughout the world who are standing up to worldwide leftist globalism. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Poland, Hungary, and Brazil, yeah. among others, yeah. uh, standing with the United States against this leftist communist globalist takeover. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you see this as in the United States? And, and it, it is spreading around the world, this whole thing. Pope Francis just, I think, believe just today, uh, came out on the side of the leftists, of course, uh, condemning racism and sort of feeding into the narrative that we're trying to unpack here. Um, and all due respect to his holiness, and I didn't read his whole statement, so I don't know everything he said. So mm. all due respect that I don't know uh, everything he said. So take that with a grain of salt. But um, what do you see, um, Jeremiah, as the the end game is to unseat unseat trump somehow had yeah. to sell this insanity what yeah do you think? You know, it has been it has been from the beginning it's been it's been cultural it's been institutional it's been you know in, in not just institutional uh you know on a local level or regional level but but on state levels on uh, federal levels with uh, national security agencies and the like and even on international levels as we saw with russiagate and the, the amount of spooks and everything else that were involved in this uh, in this play to try to make sure that we didn't get him and that if we did, that we got rid of him. And if we couldn't get rid of him, that we make sure that he's not coming back, right? That he's a, he's a one term and out, he's one and out, uh, one and done. The problem is, and, and Bill Maher was right, is that it's going to be super tough for, to convince people when they've got money and they've got a job and we had the highest rate of employment in the history of our country, all across the board, every demographic of person and group was was making more money, had had more stable job and everything else. And happiness, the happiness quotient was overall good, even even amongst groups that normally would not like Republicans, especially Donald Trump. And we saw their numbers begin to boom. And, and Mars said, look, if we don't have some kind of a recession, he's like, you know, I almost hope it happens. Well, guess what? COVID. This, this, you know, it was it was a perfect storm to say, look, it's a super scary, mysterious world. We got a lot of uh, uh, propaganda from the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party over there with with videos where we're seeing people falling over in the middle of the street without context, and people in outfits running up, you know, like they're working on ET or something, and people being dragged out of their homes and everything. We're seeing that. And then we're like, oh my gosh, it's coming to us. And there was, there was prudence required. In fact, that we, that we take a breath for a second and say, what is this we're dealing with? But at some point numbers became relevant and we were able to look at numbers and say, okay, here's a pattern. Here's how this thing works. There were statisticians that have been proved right. Okay. That say after a certain number of days, it becomes clinically non-existent. I mean, you, you don't, you don't hardly deal with it. People can go back and do what they do. And you began to see this being utilized in a way and fueled where, where we're all at home. We're all on, on uh, watching TV with the news. We're all on social media. People are on Netflix being bombarded by, you know, or, or Amazon prime being bombarded by propaganda 24 seven, you know, quarantine doesn't mean 
apart, it means together apart. Stay at home, save lives, frontline workers, all, all the stuff, frontline heroes. Every single commercial, every 10 minutes, boom, 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 boom. Super scary kids peeking over windows out of cars because the monster's out there. And so it's being bombarded and you're losing money. You're losing money. Your job is gone. You don't, and you don't know what's out there when you come back. And then you're, you know, the fear, is it going to come back again? And remember, man, this, this, it's personal to me because, you know, I was really happy on Pentecost that we had church, right? I was able to serve as therapy. We had to do a lot of curious things, man, to be able to, to do the church, you know, to go in, you had to be on a list. You had to sit every couple pews away. There was a whole bunch of rules to be able to do this, but I wasn't even supposed to be here. I was supposed to be in New Hampshire because an atheist friend of mine, when I was, when I was an unbeliever and, and I was part of the, uh, when I was part of the center for inquiry, okay. He was a good friend of mine and he was, he's a libertarian. So we had similar views on things, right? I'm, I'm a conservative. He's a libertarian, but we both, both voted for Trump and didn't want all of our friends to know, you know, because they were crazy, violent maniacs. And so we, we kept it private after a year and a half of him, of him seeing how God changed my life. Um, both him and his wife, they made the decision. We're going to start going back to church. And, and well, he'd never been really churched. His wife was raised Catholic and left many years ago. And he asked me to be a sponsor. I wasn't able to go because of the lockdown. And during that lockdown, not only was, were we bombarded with propaganda, but, but when people went out and began to protest, even in cars, separated in cars, we had the nurses with the signs, quote unquote, we don't know if they were nurses. They never even said where they worked. They're probably in black block clothes right now. But the thing is, man, is that we were told that those people are responsible for a spread, for the surge, for overwhelming the system and the healthcare workers and the frontline heroes. And the, um, you're murderous. You're racist because COVID magically uh, attacks uh, disproportionately people of color and other marginalized groups, apparently. Okay. We were told that. And on the day when I'm supposed to be there, on that day, there's a riot in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they're lighting cars on fire. The same people who said, stay home. The same people who called uh, protesters racist. The same people who sat there and said, you know, if, if you want to go back to work for your job, you hate black people and all that. Those same people are now encouraging huge numbers, thousands all across the country of black people to get in large gatherings, breathing heavy sweating all over the place, working with blood with each other if they're hit. And they don't, and all of a sudden magically, guess what? Monster's gone. They don't, oh yeah, I don't care about that anymore. It's just, it's mind blowing. I'm sorry for flipping out, man. No, yeah, it, it's, it's completely irrational. Oh. There, There is not a, a rational, uh, This, yeah, like you said, the same people who were saying stay at home or you're a racist for going out and infecting people are cheering on these, freedom fighters for coming and smashing windows in our communities and 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 uh, in all due respect i mean there's many people who are entirely peaceful certainly yeah. it's mm. certainly a, a great deal of people who are entirely peaceful but they're not they're still not concerned about covid even those peaceful protesters because they're rubbing up and uh absolutely um so i want to get to a few uh questions here um First, I had uh, TRN slash. What's your opinion of the triple melting pot theory? I'm not sure if this does come from E. Michael Jones or not, but he basically characterizes it as Catholics, Protestants, and Jews in American history, particularly. And I think that, that we definitely, I think that's very strongly a, a very strong cultural identity i mean I, I i look at these things through the lens of culture which goes back to the the cultists the worship the religious right and those three groups all have a separate religious right which forms a separate culture and there's subgroups when it when it, within each of those of course uh, but the dominant of those three is obviously the protestant anglo-saxons um from the beginning and there's a lot of chat uh chat discussion about whiteness and culture uh nationality um yeah this is these constructs also are i, I think the funny thing is i think i think catholic protestant and jew is a little bit more accurate 
definitely more accurate than when we say Irish, uh, German, whatever. I mean, even even those things were were modern inventions of you know Treaty of Westphalia, 1648. Uh, later on, the unification of European nations in the 19th century. I mean, these things, uh, the unification of the lingua franca, so so everybody's speaking a, a, a standardized dialect of, of that language. So those, the, the roots of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew are much deeper culturally, in my opinion, um, than even those those things we, when we talk about Irish or, or German. Um, but the, uh, let's see, Jeremiah, I wanted to get your take on this because I don't know much about this. Um, do you and Jeremiah disagree that Trump, Bannon, and MAGA conservatives are covering up Black Lives Matter violence because you cannot criticize Africans in America? What's your take um, on that, Jeremiah? A little bit, you know. I mean, I, I think that uh, it's it's a tough it's a tough political dance in a way, and I have to sympathize, you know, because um, when you're talking about a flashpoint. Right. And you've got you've got this huge array of people. You don't know where they're from. You don't know what groups they're with. Uh, there are people wearing masks and the like. Uh, I mean, you can watch a lot of videos of people and and not know exactly what group they're with or who left it. Like who's leaving the, the pallets of bricks, for example. If people want to say, well, it's Black Lives Matter, you know, well, maybe. I mean, you have proof of that. But there's there's a whole list. And in fact, people should go uh, the the. Uh, website that I was talking about earlier with Black Lives Matter. And I said, people can go and, and find out more over at Right Side News. They have a, a huge list of the different groups that are socialist networks and stuff that are in identitarian networks that are involved with them. And it could be any assortment of them. Now they'd be allies, but at the same time, you know, you don't, you don't always lay blame at the feet of a specific group if it's an ally who did it. Okay. I, I mean, there, there is a difference between them. And that to, I think it makes it hard because on the one hand, while it, we, while we know, and while the viewers know that black lives matter is a, an organization, right. With the dot com and, and founders and va basically mission statements and stuff like that. At the same time, culturally speaking, I would even say that the vast majority of people who say they believe that and use those phrases that they probably haven't even gone to the website that they don't know any of this stuff. It would be new to them. They even, may even wonder if we're telling the truth about it because they've never even read it, but that they have ingrained in their, in their, in their minds, a certain set of ideas and a certain set of policies or actions that are relevant to them or to people that they know or things that they, they think they know. Um, and that that coalesces with what they believe those words mean. So if you're the president and you say, I'm against this group, if that, if, tons of people otherwise not so ill-intentioned people have have this kind of coalesced idea of what those things are and have a, a false not entirely accurate understanding of it you, you could end up pulling out uh the wheat when you're when you're pulling out the weeds so to speak right and i think you just have yeah. to be careful it's a dance it's, and and i think you know i don't want to say he's running cover i think he's trying to i think he's trying to play it right he's the president of the united states so he's the president for us as much as he is for um, everybody else. Yeah, sure, man. Uh, I'm going to take this as the last question. Uh, by 2050, by 2050 st statistics predict whites will become a minority in the U.S. and several European countries. Mm -hmm. Do you believe non-Western peoples can perpetuate Western civilization? Uh, if by Western civilization you mean Christian civilization, then absolutely yes. That's the point I, I tried to make in the beginning. European civilization is the greatest civilization, but it's not because Europeans are white or better race or anything like that. It's because Christianity is the true religion. So any, any culture, no matter what race or where they come from that adopts Christianity will become the dominant culture period. Uh, it right now in the past 50 years, the global South in Latin America, especially Africa has experienced a massive conversions on a massive scale to Christianity uh, but in two forms, Pentecostalism and Catholicism. And those two forms of Christianity have exploded in those areas, in, in ma many areas in uh, Africa. Let's see if I have uh, the book ready at hand, but uh, The Next Christendom by Philip Jenkins is, is the book you want to read for that. Um, so there is a great deal of hope that people like me from a Northern European ancestry, where my own culture has 
completely succumbed to the Masonic, Communist, Protestant, whatever Jewish uh, takeover, Marxism. Our fathers have completely surrendered to it, and our civilization is dying. And I have great hope for the African cultures arising as long as they resist vehemently all the Western sort of uh, what they call the uh, neo-colonialism and not any sort of good colonialism at all. Um, as long as they resist these Western takeovers, um, I have great hope that they can spread. I mean, there's the Mexican in the United States, there's a, lot, there's a great deal of Mexican Catholicism, which has a great, a much greater roots than, I mean, I don't know, Jeremiah, if you would agree, but I, I would probably assert that in the United States, Mexican or Latino Catholicism is probably the strongest sort of ethnic Catholicism in existence in the United States at this time, because there's still a strong family culture among the Latinos that's been almost totally lost among the European Catholics. I, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but so I, I would definitely say, yes, uh, sort of quote unquote, non-Western people can definitely perpetuate uh, Western civilization. If you, if by that you mean Christianity. Um, so Jeremiah, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Have you any yeah. final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, I mentioned earlier uh, the book about culturism, uh, culturalism, uh, culturism, a word, a value, our future by uh, John Kenneth Press. He also wrote one. I don't care for the name, uh, but it says uh, up with cultural uh, culturism, down with multiculturalism. Um, and it's talking about culturist practice and policies and how they can uh, restore Western civilization. Um, but I, I agree with him. Not on everything. OK, but I agree with him insofar as he says that the idea that Western civilization as as history has had it, that it would be perpetuated the way that it's had it um, and the way that we understand it with the Western canon and other things in the, the language, the values, the cultural norms and expectations, customs and courtesies, uh, um, literary and philosophical traditions and the like, that that there is a connection between that. Um, and the the cultures of European people and that that because it's it's rooted in a history and that history is not always the same. Now, people can can uh, alter their their history a little bit. I mean, the the uh, Europeans did with the inclusion of Christianity, which was not born out of Rome. Right? Jesus wasn't a white haired uh, or a blonde haired, blue eyed white dude. OK, <laughs> like that's just a fact. And so it, it, the. Rome, uh, Europe, as it moved on, began to embrace and, and in some ways, uh, their cultures began to mesh together different ideas and to Christianize them, to baptize their cultures, so to speak, right? To baptize these nations. That can happen with, with non-Western countries. And in fact, in history, to a large part, it did, right? And it continues to this day. But when that happens, right, they become part of that, what we were talking about earlier, why we don't why, why we didn't ban marriages between different groups, because we're now all part of real Israel. We're all, we're all part of the Commonwealth of Israel at this point. Okay. And so we are together in that regard and, and they would bring with them a kind of richness that may not be rooted in the Iliad, for example, right. Might not be rooted in the, the Greco Roman tradition, but is rooted in at least not beyond what is necessary within Catholicism and insofar as Catholicism has absorbed and baptized that, that Greco-Roman tradition. Um, and that with their inclusion, you, it would change. It's not going to be the exact same. I mean, I don't know, you know, if it's just, well, they're going to get rid of all of their, their histories and cultures and traditions. I, I don't believe that. And I think we do need, I don't read a lot of E. Michael Jones, to be honest, you know, um, I got my reasons. But, uh, you know, the thing is, though, is that I do agree with that idea, right? The, the three of them coming together is probably the closest to being ecumenical, you know, or interfaith <laughs> that I can be to say that when, when we have a war on Western civilization, that forming alliances with somewhat like-minded groups on a lot of things that are just at least culturally for the preservation of, of our ideas, our values, and all the aforementioned things, that working alongside in tandem with some of these groups may not just be beneficial, but in fact might be required um, as even if we want to say 
you know, for now, we're still going to debate what we disagree on. But when it comes to this certain political thing or this certain cultural thing, you know, I'm rocking with you. But when it's over, we're going to we're going to have ourselves some debates. right? And in the meantime, continue to don't don't gloss it over. Right. We're not we're not the coexist crowd, uh, you know, meshing it up, the conduit stuff. And so I think that it's a both and that's what I'd say. Right on. Well, thanks, Jeremiah. We're going to wrap up. Let's let's offer up an Our Father uh, for these intentions. Um, and I just want to thank, before we do that, thank you for all of our patrons, our supporters. You can check out uh, Jeremiah at, at Paleocrat. His yeah. Twitter handle, as, as uh, currently displayed, is not actually his uh, main account. Uh, but it and, is my account. You got to go but, check uh, it out. Soda Popinski. <laughs> it's the crisp with a lisp. <laughs> Russian bot. It's me. Uh, and he's also at paleocratdiaries.com. Yes, man. So you can take, you. A, take a look at Jeremiah's work over there. So let's offer up an Our Father for, uh, let's pray for all parties involved in this chaos. Pray for uh, president, uh, all governments dealing with the situation. Pray for all the young people who are rioting pray for their conversion. Uh, we pray for justice, whether that's for any race whatsoever. And we pray for the healing of families, of victims. And we pray for the renewal of this economy uh, throughout the world so that we can get back to work and we can provide for our families and that our children can have something. So uh, again, let's remember the poor. Remember the people who are abandoned by this. Uh, poor business owners who are already abandoned by COVID now got their uh, front windows blown out. So remember the poor, help them in whatever way you can. Um, so let's pray. Name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.